So you want to be strong and fast. Well, you've come to the right place. Welcome back to my channel, my friends. In this video, we're gonna cover how to balance running with weight training so that you can make as much progress as possible in both. That means what running training to focus on, then what you can do in the gym to get you running even faster, how to make the most out of your gym workouts for your strength or your muscle building goals, and then how to fit all of that in to a schedule. First off, concurrent training, running and weight training. Can you even do both? Or do they just interfere with each other? Now from the research, resistance training seems to have a positive impact on running performance and on running economy. And that's why elite coaches around the world use particular methods and movements in the gym to improve their runners. And we're gonna cover some of those in this video. Quick definition for anyone who's wondering, running economy is just how much oxygen your body requires to run at a given speed. But what about the other way? Does running interfere with your gym training? So if you're trying to build muscle or get stronger or just be more explosive. A bunch of recent reviews have pulled all the data from across all the studies and found that actually it doesn't seem like it. So the scientific research is really starting to prove that weight training and running aren't these two opposite ideas that are gonna directly undo each other. But since none of us have infinite time to work on our running and our gym training all day, time really is of the essence. We need to make the most out of it. You guys can call me a productivity channel if you wish. The sports science and the world's top coaches have a bunch of training techniques and tricks for scheduling your week that we can use to help make sure we're progressing as quickly as we can in both. First up, given that we're splitting our total training time across running and weight training, so either to build strength or to build muscle, we wanna make sure that we're being as productive as we can with the time that we have for each of them. One of the most important things to balance and get right is your training intensity during the runs. And this can get way more technical very quickly. We're talking heart rates, blood lactate concentrations, ventilatory thresholds, VO2 maxes. So let's just keep it simple. A classic way to think about endurance training is to break the training up into three intensity zones. Zone one is low intensity, where you're running continuously and slowly within your aerobic threshold. Zone two is a moderate to high intensity zone. You're pushing yourself, you're shooting for a good run time, whatever that means to you. They probably feel like a seven to nine RPE, so you're pushing yourself like seven to nine hard out of 10 during that run. And then zone three is a high intensity zone. You're pushing yourself all out effort. Your active time is so intense that you need breaks. So your session's broken down into intervals of nine to 10 RPE, so you're going all out, where you're just really, that's how it feels. Actually, I just really hurt my hand. That second zone, that moderate intensity zone, is a really common way to think about endurance training. For a lot of people, especially beginners, a successful run is one where you've pushed yourself and you've finished feeling tired. And a training program that has a lot of this zone two training in it, so like 30 to 60%, is called threshold training by sports scientists. And threshold training is hard because you're regularly pushing yourself, you're regularly finishing tired, you're regularly trying to move at a good speed to get a good time. And that's hard. But when we look across the research at what produces the best running results, there seems to be another way, a better way. The sports science over the last 20 years or so shows that running in the other two zones improves running performance faster. Polarized training is the most extreme version of this, where relatively high volumes of training are performed in zone one, about 80% of your training. There's a little in zone three, about 20%, and little or none in zone two. Now, pyramidal training is just a little bit less extreme than polarized training. So you've still got 80% of your training in zone one, but then the rest is split across zone two and zone three training. That means that if you want the best running times, a great place to start is to keep about 70 to 80% of your running time in that zone one intensity range. And that's why the world's best coaches have slowly moved towards polarized training or pyramidal training in the last 20 years. And you might be thinking, wait, what about progressive overload? What about pushing myself to my limits to keep improving? You improve by pushing hard, right? 
low intensity running builds your aerobic base. It increases your capillary density and your mitochondrial volume. Subconsciously, it hones your running technique to improve your running efficiency. And it builds your aerobic engine so that you can run for longer before needing help from that anaerobic system, which is where the fatigue kicks in. And then for the remaining 20 to 30% of your running time, go for those intense interval zone three sessions or some zone two sessions if you want. Those sessions are amazing for improving how much blood your heart can pump and your muscles ability to absorb more oxygen. So your VO2 max goes up. It also trains your muscles to push out the acid that accumulates when you use lactate for energy, which happens on intense runs. But you really don't need to train at that intensity too often to get the benefits. And I'll give you an example of how your running schedule might look like once we've gone through the resistance training at the gym. Okay, we're in the gym. So how are we gonna squeeze the most out of the gym? A, for our running, and B, for other goals like building strength, building muscle, or getting more functional, or whatever it might be. First up, it's gonna really help your running if you can dedicate a little bit of your gym time to running specific training. It doesn't have to be a lot, even just a quarter of your time in the gym can make a massive difference. And that's because when you're running, in every stride as our foot hits the ground, our leg absorbs and stores ground reaction force. Our viscoelastic tissues, like your Achilles tendon, stretch under the weight of your falling body mass. And that force is stored like an elastic band and is released to spring you back up into the air. And when we train in the gym, what we're trying to do is build a stiffer spring. Now, in terms of weighted exercises, we don't want to be going to failure. So if you're used to doing hypertrophy or used to doing strength work and you're used to actually pushing close to failure, well, that's cool but it's not what we want when we're doing running specific training. When we run, our foot is in contact with the ground maximum a quarter of a second. That's not a lot of time to generate force. So we wanna target our rate of force development. And that's why a lot of strength and conditioning coaches wanna see the weight moving with consistent speed. So you could just try limiting each phase of the exercise to around two to two and a half seconds. So for running specific training, a good target to hit is about six to 10 reps with the heaviest weight you can lift. Maintaining that speed with perfect form is a perfect target. At the end of the set, you might have more slower reps in you. If they're slower and you can't maintain the speed, then it's the end of the set, doesn't matter. Next up, try bringing in a healthy dose of unilateral exercises where you train your left and your right side independently in your sessions and just try to sniff out any inconsistencies. Because running requires your left and your right to be working symmetrically and for your core to just be perfect at stabilization. So now we're gonna go through some amazing moves that can help improve your running. So the first move is step ups. We're propelling ourselves upwards. And if you feel like you're comfortable to add some weight, go for it. Alternating barbell lunges are also amazing. These are personally my favorite move. I do these so often. You could also do contralaterally loaded split squats, your regular back squat, or you can add in a front squat if you want kettlebell swings, and then you've got Romanian deadlifts, or if you prefer, you can go for classic deadlifts. Next, we've got some plyometrics. Plyometrics helps us improve the elasticity in our lower body to help us just and just spring back into the air once your foot hits the ground. And they've also repeatedly been shown to strengthen our bones and reduce the risk of stress fractures. So impact is good. Don't be afraid of impact. Okay, I'm just quickly interrupting myself to say that this is what zone one running should feel like. You should be able to maintain a conversation. Some even say you should be able to maintain an integration. So this video is sponsored by Lululemon. I'm currently running in the Bliss Fields, which are the shoes I ran in for my 24 hour run. And they're still going strong. And then all my pieces are Lululemon, including the gym shoes, which are the charge fill shoes. And I just love their pieces. Their pieces are such high quality. They're timeless and they're built to last for years and years and years. And that's why I love them so much. With plyo moves, the goal is to keep the time that we spend on the ground super quick. And the goal is to be exploding as fast and as hard as possible in every single rep. If you need to take a break to allow yourself to push with high intensity, you have to take that break. This is an endurance training, okay? You gotta take that break. So some amazing plyo moves that runners will regularly bring into their schedule are box jumps. Now, quick caveat, 
Box jumps technically aren't plyometrics, but they still train energy release and they can be a really great intro to plyometric moves if you're completely new to them. Then we've got some ninja box jumps. So you box jump down and back up as quickly as possible. We've also got some split box jumps. Then we've also got lateral hurdle hops and then some single leg hops. <laughs> Do not underestimate these. 20 to 30 seconds per set for each of your plyo moves is perfect. And the last category of training is core strengthening. Your core is so damn important. It's constantly stabilizing, constantly rotating and stretching to help you generate power and run as efficiently as possible. To run the best you can, you don't need to have six pack abs. It's not Baywatch, okay? They do run in Baywatch, but that's beside the point. What we need is a rounded, functional core that can do a little bit of everything. So some of my favorite moves to strengthen our core are front plank with rotation, side plank with rotation, which trains the diagonal elastic support mechanism, side plank leg lifts, reverse plank marches, archer press bridge, which is way more difficult than it looks, and paloff press, which you can do in a lunge position or standing or on one leg. So that's our gym training for our running and for your other goals like building strength or building muscle or whatever it might be, there's a couple of key training principles to help you get the most out of your time. Compound exercises are your best friends. They'll develop your full body strength and your full body muscle more time efficiently than isolation exercises. So really focus on exercises that engage multiple muscle groups like squats or deadlifts or pull-ups, or lap pull-downs, press-ups, or chest press, leg press, barbell row, dumbbell thrusters, plate snatch, alternating dumbbell snatch, side lunges. I could keep going, but those are some of my favorites. Isolation moves are totally okay to do, of course, but if you're splitting your training time between the gym and running, time really is of the essence. If you wanna boulder them shoulders, that's fine, but maybe you don't spend the entire session just doing that. If you wanna build more muscle, remember that the research shows improving results from extra sets up to 12 sets per muscle per week. So for your key muscles, try to get those 12 sets in each week. And if you can't get any more or you can't hit 12 sets for non-priority muscles, don't stress about it. Supersets can also be a very loyal friend here, specifically antagonistic supersets where you train muscles that work in opposite directions, like doing a chest press and following up straight away with a dumbbell row. That will allow your muscles to get full recovery time. But for you to fit in what would be, what could be a one hour session into 40 minutes. If you're in the gym three times a week, a split I really like is lower body, upper body, full body. That way, if you bring in some compound exercises, you could be hitting those 12 sets per muscle per week all over. Plus that full body day is super flexible. So you can spend extra time working on anything you might have missed, or maybe just your priority muscle groups or your goals. Full body days are great for that flexibility. So you can just tinker and tweak each week. So next up is your weekly schedule. There's a couple of things here I think are definitely worth bringing in and then the rest you can just experiment with and figure out what feels good to you. First up, for your running to actually get better, we spoke about how we don't wanna be running intensely all the time. But when you do, it's so important that you're rested and fresh. We wanna hit those sessions without any fatigue so that you can hit your true maximum output. So I'd put those intense running sessions after a full rest day. And then once you've had your intense running sessions, give your legs a bit of time to rest and recover and chill. The next day is the perfect time for an upper body session. And that gives us a start of our weekly schedule. Second tip with your gym workouts, try to give each muscle group at least a day of rest before hitting them again. So if you've got two gym days back to back, try splitting them as upper body and lower body so that you're not hitting the same muscle groups twice in a 48 hour window. Number three, coming back to that topic around interference between your gym and running training, the only type of interference that the studies potentially found was in specifically explosive strength development when running and strength training are within a few hours of each other or part of the same session. We're still researching and trying to figure out the exact details, you know, that biological fine print of how far apart we should keep these sessions, but it could be a nice idea to just train them 
on separate days. Or if you really want to train them on the same day, at least have four to five hours apart between the sessions, if you can, of course. So as an example of these three tips in action, let's say you had five days a week to train, it could look something like on day one, you've got 20 minutes of low intensity running, followed by 20 minutes of zone three intense running interval training. Then on day two, you can take that upper body workout in the gym to let your legs recover and chill. And on day three, you can hit that lower body again in the gym. Day four, take it as a rest. On day five, after your rest day, you've got a 60 to 70 minute low intensity run. It's completely fine if these long, low intensity runs come after a lower body gym day or even a full body gym day because they're low intensity. We're staying within your aerobic threshold. So a little bit of muscle soreness is completely fine. And actually these runs tend to even help with muscle soreness. So don't worry if your muscles are feeling a little bit tight going into this run. Day six, we're going back to the gym to do a full body workout. And then day seven is a rest day so that you're ready for your high intensity run the following day. So with that split, in a week, we'd have 80 minutes of zone one running and 20 minutes of zone three running. And just a quick caveat with that zone three training, we're counting the entire session. So the intervals and the rest times between the intervals, not just the intervals. Otherwise that would just be absolutely savage. And if you're just a zone two lover, you could just swap in that zone three training for some zone two training every other week and maybe increase the session time from 20 minutes to 30 or up to 40 minutes. And then to improve your running in the gym, you could dedicate 15 to 20 minutes of your lower body day and your full body day to those running specific moves that we covered earlier in the gym. And then the rest of the time you can just work on whatever goal you want in the gym whatever it is, the gym's your oyster. And the last thing I just wanna quickly cover is how to tweak your approach to just get it perfect for you. Now the split between your running and gym time is completely down to you and your priorities. If your priority is running, you could maybe shift down to two gym sessions a week, maybe use it as like two full body days and then add in an extra running session each week. Also, improving in two areas can be really tough and it gets more and more demanding the more advanced you get in each. So look out for yourself. Have eyes at the back of your head. Be your own guardian angel. Don't forget to look out for the big signs of overtraining. First up, higher and higher RPE. So higher levels of tiredness than you would expect during each workout. Or feeling low or depressed or irritable or sudden changes in your appetite or just a lack of concentration. There's obviously many more, but look out for yourself. And to help with that, it can be really helpful to track your external and your internal training load. So your external training load is to do with your programming. How many miles are you running per week? How much time are you spending training per week? Yeah. Your internal load is about how much stress that work is putting on your body. So measuring things like your average heart rate or your rate of perceived exertion during your training sessions or even how you're recovering. Make sure you're keeping an eye on both sides, not just one, to help make sure that you're not overtraining. And that's it. Now go forth into this world and be speedy and strong. Be powerful and quick. And I love you guys. I believe in you, you're gonna crush it. And I'll see you next time. Bye.